we've forgotten that there's a God that we have to answer. Dealing with people who reject truth. I'm wondering in my mind why life is so difficult for me. 340 million people who are suffering. Real stories. Here's a man who's responsible for almost 7 billion people. Real issues. How much does peer pressure actually exist? And real views. Gangs exist at every level. This is Real Talk. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on to you. My name is Osama Safi, and thank you for joining us for this new episode of Real Talk, filmed in the sunny state of California, where we are going to look at the concept of idol worship that is shirk in a modern society. Now, I'm joined by our wonderful panelists, our amazing studio audience, and of course, our beloved viewers at home. But before we begin, let's take a look at a word on the street. The Prophet Muhammad, Mustafa, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has once said that this life is like a heaven for the disbeliever and a hell for the believer. We live in a world where problems arise every single day because of the society that surrounds us. Problems such as drugs, alcohol, promiscuity, and violence. These vices confront and tempt us every day, whether it be through our friends, technology, or school. And as Muslims that believe in the Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian, may Allah be pleased with him, we have a higher calling and must avoid these vices at all costs. One way to avoid these vices is through brotherhood. There's a great example of the importance of brotherhood that begins with a young man stranded in a hole. The most important tool for fostering brotherhood is the house of God. Going to the masjid is essentially the first step towards establishing unity and brotherhood. On a warm Thursday evening in Chino, California, Kudam arrived at Baitul Hamid Mosque to attend a question and answer session led by Imam Shamsad Ahmed Nasser and to attend congregational prayer. After Isha Namaz, the Kudam gear up to play some basketball, warming up and stretching for the games to be played that night. So uh, coming to Bethel Hamid Mosque to play basketball right here um, on the Zar Khan court, Pretty awesome. Uh, we get a whole bunch of Qadam that come around Isha time, uh, do namaz, and then we play uh, usually till how, how long would you say? We play till about 11 o'clock, and uh, we not, we get more hours in at the masjid, not just the basketball courts. We, we play about six hours a week, and uh, it brings us all together from different towns. And not only that, it serves a purpose for the outside community. We get a lot of non amdis that come every week to play with us also, so it serves as a good form of the bleak. Yeah, and uh, it's awesome because outside of the mosque, um, here in America, we're seen as not American enough. And then if you look at Ahmadis over in Pakistan, they're seen as uh, not Muslim enough. And so uh, us growing up here, coming to the basketball courts and playing a sport we love is uh, where we the, belong. It's where we belong. Where we belong yeah. Basketball, uh, in my eyes, I think it, would, it kind of builds camaraderie amongst each other. You're kind of out there on the court and it transcends... Uh, all sorts of differences, race or whatever, and you just play ball. 30 minutes away from Baitul Hamid Mosque, a different kind of brotherly bonding between Ahmadis is occurring at the University of California, Riverside. You know, growing up in a Western society, we face a lot of trials and tribulations on a daily basis. We have to deal with a lot of different immoral activities, a lot of social vices 
that we look at, and especially in college. College is, you know, the time where you get that freedom, the independence from your parents. You know, some of us, we move out from our parents' household. We go and live in a dorm, and there's no one supervising us. Where before, you know, we had our parents looking over us, making sure we prayed five times a day, we didn't do anything bad. Here in college, you were on our own, essentially. And what's really good for us here is that we have several colleges in which we have many of our Amity, you know, members that attend. And because of that, we have that guidance. We have someone looking over us so we can make sure that we're not doing something bad. On top of that, you know, going to a community, a college, a university in which you have several of your members, it's really beneficial because it also fosters brotherhood between the members. Many of us, we have several classes together since we are in the same age group in the same school year. And because of that, we study together a lot. That also helps us, you know, bond, we get to know each other, we joke around with each other, and all around it brings us, you know, gives us a good atmosphere. We focus on our spiritual needs as well as our academic needs. The bonds of brotherhood are, you know, strengthened and we become closer to each other. So this isn't just a friendship. We consider each other family. Indeed, we do live in a world that is in need of reformation. We live in a spiritually dead society which needs to be brought back to life. To do this, the youth must make sure that they are strong and steadfast, and they can do that through brotherhood. That was great. Now let's introduce the amazing panelists that we have with us here today. On my far right, I have Professor Patrick Mason. Thank you for joining us, Professor Matt. Patrick. Great to be here, thanks. Be here. Professor pa Patrick Mason is an Associate Professor of Religion at the Claremont Graduate University. Professor Mason has also taught at the University of Notre Dame and the American University at Cairo. Professor Mason has also written the book, The Mormon Menace, Violence and Anti-Mormonism in the post film South. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Next, we have Brother Rahman Alim Sahib. Rahman Alim Sahib was raised as a Christian and then experienced the fine hospitality of California's prison system before he reverted back to Islam in 1997. Brother Alim Saib is also uh, part of the, the League Secretary team here in LA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum rahmatullah. Next, we have Brother Abdul Ahid Sahib. Brother Abdul Ahid Sahib is a senior lecturer of mathematics, teaching at the high school and college level for the past 20 years. Besides that, at the local level, Abdul Ahid Sahib is also the Tarbiyat Secretary for Majlis Ansarullah, the auxiliary group here of the MD Muslim community in Los Angeles, and nationally, part of the primary adjudicator for the Qaza board. Jazakallah and assalamu alaikum for joining us. Assalamu alaikum, my pleasure. I'm privileged to be here. So the question that we're going to look at today is shirk, idol worship. The founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mizza Ghulam Ahmad al the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, analyzed shirk into three categories. That is, one, a worship of objects and things, such as a worship of stone, trees. Second, a reliance on a way or means, rather than a reliance on God. And lastly, comparing oneself to God. But before we even look at these categories, I think it's first important to kind of look at the fact of why is idol worship even detrimental to society? Ahedzab, will you guide us on this question as to why we should even be worried about idol worship? Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. If it were the case that the idols we look up to encourage us to reach up high, one could give it a pass. But most of the idols that we see around us are humans with very big limitations, and they do not encourage us to go up, reach up to any high levels. On top of that, they crash and burn every so often. So it is disastrous to hitch one's star or hitch one's card to a distant star uh, of the susceptibility level of modern day idols. That's an interesting point. We know that in Islam, idol worship, shirk, is considered to be a very grave sin, one that in the Quran is actually mentioned to not be forgivable, which is interesting because the two most emphasized quality of God's attributes are his grace and his mercy. Thus, God is very merciful and forgives many sins. So then it makes us really wonder, what a, is it about shirk that could have such a high displeasure in God's eyes? And I think you've hit it on the point. One of the aspects is the fact that you worship something that is 
temporary, that isn't sustainable, and that will, di that will die just like yourself. So then, just as God told us that our purpose on earth was to worship him, if we aren't doing that and we're worshiping something else, it's as if we degrade our own selves. Um, Alim Saab, what is your idea on kind of this comment going off of what Ahad Saab was saying, that we're degrading our own selves? In what way have you seen in society people degrading themselves through worshiping various idols? If one realizes that Allah is all-knowing, all-seeing, gracious and merciful, and the one who gives us everything we need, but then you find some adamant object that you place above him, now you have taken the majesty of the gracious and merciful God and relinquished his power, his grace, his mercy, and you put it into inanimate things. And as my friend Ahad Saif said, these things eventually dissipate and disappear, and you're left all alone. Now, I'd like to take it to the audience. We've grown up in a Western society where, unfortunately, there may be a type of reliance on shirk, on idol worship, whether or not it's actually real stones or if it's some other type of form. How many of you have friends or have seen in everyday life people, to a certain extent, worshiping something and then seeing it destroyed and then seeing what happens to them after that? So um, the topic that we're talking about, shirk, um, I've actually, in college, uh, have witnessed the effects of this in two parts. Um, the first, as I can say, is um, I had a friend who was Hindu, and as we all know, that they believe in idols to get to God, essentially. And, uh, you know, he was a very general individual, and he, he utilized the idols to, to get to God, but he was a good person. It didn't, it didn't affect his life negatively, but there was another friend of mine who, it's a different form of shirk in the sense where not necessarily he, he, he put the equivalence as, as God, but he gave this thing more time, which was gambling. And it really affected his life negatively. And, and, and that can be, in a way, association partners with God because he was a Muslim. And, and knowing his obligation, I'm a Muslim as well, uh, of our obligation to number one God, you know, you cannot put your emphasis and all your time and attention to something that's going to keep you away from the purpose of our life, which is to worship God. So in these two examples, um, which I want to bring to the panel as well, it, it's the time to ask a question, is that in, in this form, what are you guys' viewpoints, where there was one individual that w worshipped this idol to get to God, but was a good person and, and, and did good works, and there was another person who, who knew that he didn't believe in idols or anything, but he, he kind of associated partners with God by doing other things than fulfilling his purpose to God. What is your guys' take on that uh, in terms of those two differences? That's a great question, and I think, Pastor Mason, if you don't mind tackling that one on. Sure, I, I think it's a, it's, it's a terrific question. I think, especially with your second friend, you know, there aren't very many people who would say, I worship idols right? Or, or an, I, I'm an idol worshiper. But, but it's, it's not just the, the formal worship of, of what we might recognize as idols, uh, but, it, but it's where are, you, where are your values? Where, what are you oriented towards? What do you think about uh, when you don't have to think about anything else? Uh, what, what have you devoted your life to? And, uh, and, and I think that's where so much of modern day idolatry comes from. And, and that can be quite degrading to us because it distracts us from love of God, from love of humanity, from service to other people. Uh, it, it orients us towards ourself. And so, so I think, you know, a lot of other people use ways to help them focus on God. And so ultimately, I mean, they're orienting themselves towards, I think, higher values. It's, it's when we focus on these things which are really detrimental, which focus on ourselves, which focus on material objects. Uh, those things, I, I think, are, are a really dangerous form of modern-day idolatry. We have a question in the front. Yeah. Just to uh, reiterate the question, um, the host brought up three points, and I wanted to target one of them. It's when you were um, associating partners, and those partners are humans. So I had a friend 
you know, he really worshipped, you know, a particular celebrity. And what I noticed here is when he riveted his attention to a tangible object like humans, he's basically riveting his attention to someone who is relatable. This is a person that's flesh and blood. This is a person just like him. You're looking into a mirror, but you're looking into someone who's excelled beyond you. But at the end of the day, the crux right here is that this person is just like you. He shares the same flaws. He shares the same shortcomings. And so every one of these persons are ultimately inclined to reach a downfall. And so what my friend did here is he didn't realize what was so cataclysmic about investing and anchoring all your attention into one person like this is the relatability. That's the thesis of what I'm saying. Because these people are so relatable, you integrate a part of yourself into them. And when they downfall, it's just a glaring reminder to yourself then that if these people can fall that are so great, that are up exalting the stars, then who's to say that a low life like me can't fall either. And I think that these symbols, these um, investments of, you know, character into these idols and these celebrities and other people, Brad Pitt and such, are ultimately not as, um, the ephemerality of it, it's not as perpetual as worshiping God. And I know we can't really uh, categorize, you know, who's to say that this person who's worshiping this human being is destined for downfall. But what I can say here is qualify it. Because That's a good everybody. Point. I mean, yeah. what you're saying yeah, is really kind of unpacking something that. You know, you're worshiping something that's just like you. And if that person can fall, who's to say that you can't fall? What does this reminder tell you? So it's really the subliminal message here. It's, uh, Excuse me. But uh, it's one of the many reasons I kind of, I'm a big sports guy. And from what my brother just mentioned, it's one of the reasons I admire Charles Barkley. Here's a man who's gone from the fields of Alabama to being a great celebrity uh, on TV 24 hours a day, uh, TNT, uh, great basketball player, all of the above. And he made a very pronounced statement that a lot of people took offense at. I'm not a role model, is what he said. I'm not a role model, but his actions proved that what he said was very true. Later on, it was proven that Charles Barkley had a major issue with gambling and owed millions of dollars to the casinos in Las Vegas. So his actions showed that don't worship me, don't be like me, because I can fall like anybody. Right. So I buy that. Yeah. Especially here in Los Angeles, with Hollywood just being down the street and being the center of so much pop culture, it's unfortunate for some of us who might be growing here, it's a privilege, but at the same time, a negative detriment if we see the lives of celebrities only through this kind of clear, crisp, square image of the camera where you don't see any of their faults and you don't see anything that would make you not want to be like them. They're amazing, they're cool, right, they're rich and everything, so then you just feel naturally kind of gravitated towards that. And that's something that we should probably fight against. One thing that we've been talking though that has also been coming up in these last two statements is that we're talking about idol worship. Something that needs to be unpacked is the idea of worship. Professor Mason kind of talked about how we remember a lot of these things. And in the Quran, we talk about how the remembrance of God is one of the greatest virtues. So what are the different types of ways that we may indirectly worship something? It's not necessarily prostrating before something, not necessarily raising our hands and doing a prayer, but there's certain ways we might be indirectly worshiping something without realizing it. And in what ways might we be doing that? Ahad Saad, if you could take a charge on that. Yes, Mike Plantel are high school students. And uh, what I have noticed is that uh, the boys and the girls obsess over sometimes the same person, and that person is usually a celebrity. Uh, at the present time, Mr. Bieber takes the cake. Uh, everyone has his picture on his or her folder. <clears throat> the girls usually do. And uh, the ladies, uh, the lady of the moment is Selena Gomez. Uh, ever, every so often, I notice that these pictures change. And uh, I ask, what happened to your old set? Oh, I hate her. Or I hate him. Why? Because he or she has disappointed me in a certain way. And so this idol worship, I have seen blossoming or booming before my eyes. But then I see a quick transition to another idol. So the children do realize, and I should, I should say that most, most of them do realize, that their idols are really very temporary. Uh, so this lack of permanence is a major detriment to the life focus of any individual. Right, right. 
I mean, even growing up in our own lives, we remember NSYNC, we remember the Backstreet Boys, we remember all these bands that were so big at one point in time, but now are just mere memories. So that's really kind of what you can do with any idol. They just become mere memories. Whereas the remembrance of one true God is something that happens before you're even alive and even after your own death. Something that's permanent and something you can sustain yourself from and gain more um, blessings and more strength to yourself. Now, looking back at what the promised Messiah Salam, said about the three forms of idols, or the three categories of idols, that is a general worship of objects and things, an excessive reliance or means rather than a reliance on God and comparing oneself to God, I think it'd be interesting if we can think of some examples of the first category, that is an excessive reliance, or a, 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 it'd be interesting if we could look at the first category, that is a general worship of objects and things. Professor Mason, do you have any uh, kind of just brainstorming, shooting off the top of your head, what would be a list of things that you would think that people are just generally worshiping, worshiping as an object? We see it all the time. I mean, people worship their cars. People worship money. Uh, people worship all kinds of material things uh, that, again, might not look like a stone god, but, right. but the way they treat it, right. it sure, they sure act like right. it's a god. Uh, and uh, the kind of love and care they give to their BMW or something like that. <laughs> I mean, this, that, that might, as, for all intents and purposes, that, that thing might be a god for them. So I think material objects, it's, it's a real problem we have. I mean, we're, we're blessed with abundance in so many places in the world, including uh, here in California. But, uh, but, but there's a fine line but between uh, enjoying the blessings that God has given us uh, versus uh, placing our reliance in them and focusing uh, our attention on them. Right. I think it's very well said. I mean, if we just go back to the audience and think about ourselves, how many of us have a cell phone? And how many of, the, how many of us have smart cell phones that are smartphones? Well, to what extent are we using those smartphones as just merely phones or are we using them as something that we give so much attention to that we're constantly on it, checking every moment? Um, so just going to the audience, what are some ways that you think we can use our phones, which we all have, in a way that is not as if we're worshiping our phone? I think it's important when, when it comes to cell phones that we really um, not let it take time away from from other things that are more important, such as Salat and Namaz. Um, you can easily get caught up on your phones on, on social media these days with your smartphones, on Facebook, on Twitter, um, and hours can go by and you're not even realizing. It's similar to what we had a few years ago when computers were the, were the huge thing in the internet. Um, so now that's, that dynamic is kind of shifting from the sitting using your PC for hours on end to people being on their phones for hours on end. So being able to put the phone down um, when the call for prayer is made or, or when you have an important uh, meeting to go to at the mosque or, or even for your secular knowledge and education, to be able to turn the phone off um, and pay attention to things that are more important. Mm -hmm. And you also raised an interesting point, and that is social media. Looking at the third category that the Promised Messiah al-Islam talked about in regards to idol worship, that is comparing oneself to God, to what extent do we see that in social media? How many of us wonder how many retweets we got or how many times our Twitter got favorited or how many followers you have? Should we be caring about those things or is that something that is making us feel as if we have some type of authority that people are listening to us? So what it's all about, it's all about balance. Um, we live in a society where we have to use our smartphones. Um, you know, this, this show, for example, Real Talk is something that's on YouTube which I've seen it. So um, we really have to have a balance in like what Professor Patrick said uh, in regards to remembering God and what Sufyan said um, in, in terms of, you know, when it's time to pray, are you making that shift or is this object just, you know, taking all of your focus and attention to where you can't even remember what's important? So I think that's the key factor is that we live in a society where we have to have core values where we know, you know, am I using this thing too much or is it really affecting my life? I think that's the bigger question. And my question to the panel was that worshiping and looking up to somebody, I think there's a, there's a fine line between the two, you know. When, when I figured, when I think of worship, worshiping somebody, I mean the only thing I worship is God. You know, when I pray, when I prostrate. And as opposed to that form of worship, if somebody looks up to somebody, like a basketball player, like Kobe Bryant, you know, for example, who's a great basketball player, he loves the way he plays, and he looks up to him, but he doesn't necessarily worship him. So where do you draw the line between worshiping and looking up to somebody? Ahasad, I'd like to take on that question. 
that line is hard to draw for many people. But if one can remember that the person is simply a guide or an example of high achievement level, then I think we can draw the brakes or put on the brakes when necessary. But an example of an excessive self-reliance or self-estimation was obtained some years ago. There was a news article that a famous athlete, his first name is Daryl, and I think most of us will know the last name, was driving around a stadium where a game was to be played. He was in an open vehicle, probably a Jeep, and he actually shot his gun at the spectators who were surrounding the stadium just for fun, and he injured quite a few people. Now I ask myself, why would a star player who is about to play in a game in an hour or so shoot people? The only answer I can think of is that he thought himself super powerful, getting to be a god or a near god. And so that self-estimation, that excessive self-estimation is clearly visible here. Right. That's a really interesting point, and that's a point that we're going to keep on looking at. Stay tuned. We'll be taking our break and coming back shortly. The Review of Religions is one of the longest-running religious magazines. In print since 1902, it continues to play an important role in presenting the noble teachings of Islam, reflecting its rational, harmonious and inspiring nature. It features articles and viewpoints on different religions, making religion and religious philosophy accessible to a wider readership. The Review of Religions was founded by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, who claimed on the basis of divine revelation that he was the promised Messiah and Mahdi whose advent had been foretold by the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, and by the scriptures of other faiths. The annual subscription of this unique and enlightening magazine is just £15 per year or US$30. dollars. To receive your copy of the Review of Religions, visit our website at www.reviewofreligions.org where you can browse past issues and subscribe online, or contact us by email to info at reviewofreligions.org. The Review of Religions, a unique magazine of religious thought. Welcome back. So we were talking about a very interesting discussion led by Professor Mason on the idea of shirk within a college campus. It's a time where a student is very privileged and they have many opportunities yet they engage themselves on such a reliance on drugs such as alcohol that they destroy themselves when they have such a potential to excel for themselves. Now, it's almost really interesting because people glorify themselves about messing up. We have people who post photos on Facebook, tweet about how they were extremely intoxicated at whatever party they went to. Now, why do you think that is for people to be so proud of worshiping alcohol or worshiping whatever drug that they're doing, that they post on Facebook or Twitter their own humility, their own humiliation. Uh, that's actually a, a very interesting uh, comment that you gave. And um, there was actually a, a recent study, um, I don't re recall the source, but it actually attributed that Facebook um, causes people to become depressed. It's an actual big cause of depression. Uh, and the reason, like you mentioned right now, for example, if somebody goes in and, and posts a picture or tweets something, you know, of them going to a party, right, then it normalizes that behavior. And what it does is it takes people away from morality. That's the essential, I think, uh, defining characteristic of shirk. It takes you away from the moral compass of what religion is based on. So um, back to that main thing I wanted to ask the panel is that smaller degrees of things, like, for example, you know, an innocent thing where my nephew, for example, it was time for prayer, and he was playing a video game, and he was very in tune to that video game where he missed prayer. So would you guys consider that a form of shirk? And if so, how can we avoid something like that? William Saab, can you take this question? Yes, but, but first, let's ask ourselves a question real quick here. No man or woman wakes up one morning and says, you know, I think I've become dependent on alcohol or dependent on drugs. So you ask yourself then, why did this happen? Where did this dependency come from? Be it the video game, be it texting or tweet or whatever. We are a people who want to be, yeah, look at me, or the tough guy, or the sexy pretty girl. 
but I have this hang up. I'm bashful or I'm a little coward or whatever. I drink some gin. Woo, man, I feel good now. Or I snort some drugs. Oh yeah, I'm tough, I'm, I'm sexy. Uh, these weaknesses that we perceive in ourselves cause us to decide I need to so do something to alleviate these weaknesses. I need to feel good about myself. How can I do it? Here comes Joe Blow. Hey, Susie, drink this scotch. Susie drinks the scotch. She goes to the party. Woo, she's shaking, you know, and everything's looking good. Everybody wants to be with her. Now she feels like, oh, I'm somebody. Then the little nerd in the corner, he might snort a little methamphetamine, a little cocaine, whatever it is. And now all of a sudden he stands up and like, yeah, mess with me. You know, I'm a tough guy now. So what eventually happens is we find that thing that makes us feel good about ourselves. But as far as the person that's just tweeting on the video game, he's fascinated by the ability to control a game. Uh, I'm very fearful of these games that cause you to just, oh, look, I'm just killing everything. I'm killing everybody. A 10, 12-year-old kid, 13-year-old kid, 15-year-old kid, killing everything he can on a video game. What message is it sending to that child? Eventually, that child may grow up and say, you know what, let me try this in real life. That's an interesting example, especially here in Western societies. Many of us have grown up with video games. Many of us have grown up with video games, such as Grand Theft Auto, where these type of activities are not only available, but they're encouraged, where you're supposed to mass kill multiple individuals. We know that the time that we give to something is a type of worship. Do you think that people today are worshiping their video games? Are they becoming idols and not something else? In the back? Um, I, I think it kind of does, uh, going back to the point, maybe not video games, but say a um, basketball game. Um, summertime, it's the Lakers, it's playoffs or it's finals. Kobe, Kobe's playing, it's the fourth quarter, and all of a sudden it's Namaz time. It's time to do your prayers. Um, what do you do? Do you, okay, hold on, I gotta stop, I gotta, you know, sure you have TiVo maybe, um, <laughs> but who wants to record? you know, the fourth quarter, third minute of the end of the game versus watching, um, watching it live. And so I think, you know, that's where it gets, to, it's kind of tough to say, hey, do I stop what I'm doing and go do namaz or do I not? But I think if you choose not to, then you kind of are, in a sense, committing shirk. Right. To um, tap down on the point that you mentioned, I think uh, the biggest tragedy in society today is you have, you know, this, this efflorescence of technology and it gives us social media and games, like you said, but what's growing faster than technology? If you look inside yourself, it's our ego. And the tragedy here is that we're not worshiping our games, we're worshiping ourselves because, you know, you, know, you can attribute violence and, um, okay, I'm gonna shoot this kid in the game, okay, why don't I do that in real life? You can attribute violence to abusive parents. You know, we can't just name games as the biggest influence on what these people are doing. I think the biggest influence on what these people have done is sort of this cult of domesticity, okay? I'm gonna protect my ego because that's what I have down at the core. You know, people don't anchor themselves to God when they're born. Like, you don't accept faith when you're born, you know? It takes some time to cultivate it and you inherit it. So, at our very base, you know, we're, we're blank slates, you know, we're trying to work and try to figure out, okay, um, what should I be, what should I do? And so influences like these, your games and stuff that kind of taint, you know, that ego of yours and then force you to protect it and shield it even more really just pivots us in this direction that we must um, worship our egos because our egos are really that internalism that we're born with. And so the, the crux of what I'm saying here is that we're not worshiping games at all. What we're really worshiping is our egos, and that in turn That's a really good point. I mean, we creates really mechanisms for us to defend it, and, and that can lead to violence, and that can lead to anything of that right, sort. Right, right. And since people worship their egos, they forget that, as Islam teaches us, we're all born a Muslim. We're all born pure. But unfortunately, it's kind of through the different filters that we put on in life that we create an ego that we don't necessarily have. And maybe social media is a manifestation of this. We are put in situations where we think we have some authority and we believe we're comparable to God and that isn't necessarily the case. There's a statistic that, in, that shows that 
Facebook is an increasing cause of divorce. Islam, though, teaches us that spouses are supposed to be a fabric for each other, a garment for each other to cover themselves and to help each other and to hold their faults. This is the teaching shown to us by our beloved master, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, 1400 years ago. Yet unfortunately that message hasn't been as applied as people should be. And as Muslims, and especially as Amdi Muslims, we should definitely make an extra effort to ensure that we watch out for those type of advices, vices. Yeah? Um, what I think is that, um, back to what Zakaria Pai was saying, that he said that if you're watching the last quarter of like, say, a Lakers game and Namaz time starts, I think what happens is that we get unsens unsensitized to the feeling that, oh, we need to go to Namaz when we keep on repeating this fact that we're stopping and not doing our namaz just for the sake of watching a game. And when we do it repeatedly many times, we're, our emotions are stopped for a namaz and we're like, oh, we can still do this and it will be fine and we can do our namaz later. And the Holy Prophet said, avoid shirk because it is more subtle than footprints on soft soil. That's an interesting concept. And it's also even interesting more to see that conveniently enough, alcohol commercials are kind of showing this various type of shirk through these various superstitions that people do in order to have their best player do the move that they want them to do in order to win the game. Yet, at the end of the day, we realize that it is Allah who created us and who is the originators of our death who ultimately has control over any type of game that is in life. And if we don't take the time to pray to Allah, but instead take the time to flip a quarter because we think that it'll help us get what we need in a superstitious manner, then I mean, that's really a, a direct example of shirk. Little comment right here? Okay, I wanna add a comment that for me, um, when we see Kobe play, it's the sense of urgency, the ment his mentality to win. That's what we wanna, we will look up to. Um, the will to do better, the will to win, to, to be successful. And there are people out there that they idolize them. And see, sometimes when they idolize them, they, in a way, they do too much. And when see, they have their pictures or whatnot, and when the celebrity, let's say, gets married to someone, they would like, there are people out there that would commit suicide for that, just because they idolize them too much. So I think like idolizing them to that extent is a bit too much. So I want to um, get Professor Patrick's view on that. Like, do you think, um, I love them that much that they would um, commit suicide. I think is that something that we're doing wrong? And if, if so, what are we doing that we should correct it? That's a good point. Uh, the fact is that there's many people that we give a lot of importance to, especially here in Los Angeles. The Lakers are our home team, and we respect them for that. But is it possible for us to kind of distill the positive attributes of Kobe Bryant his athleticism, his courage, his ability to shoot on, um, on demand versus us trying to worship him to the extent that our whole room is covered with posters of Kobe. We have a Kobe hat, we have a Kobe pants, we have a Kobe shirt. Is that really necessary? Is that something that might subconsciously affect us? Because as we know, as Promised Messiah has told us, Allah Salaam, that as the Promised Messiah, Allah Salaam, has told us in the philosophy of teachings of Islam, that the physical manifestations that we have affect our spiritual manifestations. So the clothes that we wear might affect our mental and spiritual manifestations. To what extent do we want to be inundated with clothing of celebrities or of athletes if it makes us think of them to be higher on the pedestal than they really are? So we had a question here in the middle. So my question is, uh, where exactly is the idolizing originating from? Is it the people that are like creating these idols or is it the media that's creating these idols for us to idolize. Professor Mason, if you could take that on. I think it's a great question. I think it's a little bit of both happening at, at the same time. I mean, I, I think no doubt the media is implicated in this and, and uh, they sell advertising dollars and, they, uh, and, and they, they want you to watch their program and so they're gonna build up these people or the movie stars or the sports stars, whoever it is, so that your eyes are on that TV or, or on your phone or wh whatever the media outlet is. So, so I think the media clearly has a role in this. But, but then, uh, you know, we, we feed into that. It, it's, it's both the, the people that they're portraying but it's us too. 
I mean, the, the, the reason that, uh, that they get the advertising dollars is because they know how, however many million people are watching this. And so, so we have the, the right, we have the power to vote with our feet and to say, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to participate in this kind of modern day idol worship, if, if we want to call that. The, 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 instead, we're going to focus on other things. We're going to focus on more authentic relationships. We're going to put the phone down, the video game down, and, and uh, the, we're, we're going to log off Facebook occasionally, you know, and, and engage in authentic relationships of service, of humanity, of, of learning, of education, these kinds of things that, uh, um, that, that aren't glorified in the, in the media the, the, the way that other things are. That's an interesting point. So far, we've been focusing on the third branch of categorization of idolism that the Prophet Messiah Allah, Salam, has been talking about, that is comparing oneself to be comparable to God. We've been looking at these celebrities, these athletes, who compare themselves to God, and because of their comparing to God, we may fall into the trap of relying on their so-called beneficiaries or so-called grace and trying to extract some type of benefit from that. And the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, emphasized that it is really the second category of modern day idol worship that is an excessive reliance on a ways or a mean instead of the reliance of God that we see today. Professor Mason, you're talking about how we can vote with our feet. To what extent, though, are people really voting with their feet? Are people really actually um, giving too much importance to a big name university or a big name company and not working for it when they really should be? Are they just kind of riding the wave of the name? Well, I think that happens a lot of times. I think, I think that's exactly what happens is, is that we ride the wave because it's, it's comfortable. Everybody else is doing it. Yeah, you know, how often do we, do we hear that? But that's not an excuse. It's not an excuse for a person of integrity, a person of virtue. The, 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 we have to stand up. We have to have our own moral compass. So there are all kinds of, of these ways and means that, that do distract us uh, from God. It, it could be a big corporation, as, as you said. It, it could be allegiance to, to a university or something. It, it could be uh, something, something like violence, right? That, that, that we think the violence is redemptive, that violence works, that the, the violence is, is effective. That's a ways and means that, that is competitive with the way of God, which is a way of peace, a way of reconciliation, uh, a way of love. And, and so, so whenever we submit ourselves or, or go along, even if everybody else is doing it, when we go along with these ways and means, then, then we're, we're putting ourselves at odds with, with the true nature of God. Right, right. In Islam, we're taught in the Holy Quran that the very first opening chapter, Surah Al-Fatiha, all praise belongs to God. But to what extent is all praise belonging to God if we are just praising the ways and the means and forgetting God? Um, Alim Saab, can you think of any examples where people are kind of forgetting this praise and relying on other things instead? Good example was uh, Anik talked about media. What role does media play in distracting us from what is most important? We sit around and we watch our TV. Our TV tells us that Kobe Bryant is the greatest. Our TV tells us that the Patriots are the best football team. We uh, praise uh, Usain, uh, what's his name, the track star. Usain Bolt. Usain Bolt. We have gotten away from the religious, the spiritual, the real true makeup of our existence. Allah says, I've created you to worship me. How many of us have taken that and broken, breaking it down to understand what does it mean? My friend talked about fourth quarter and uh, three minutes left, Lakers down by three points. What do I do? Do I go for Isha Namaz? Do I go for Maghrib Namaz? Or do I stay and hope that Kobe wins this game? If we're grounded into our belief, our faith, it's no way. There's no way you're going to stay home and watch the TV. You'll TiVo it. I've been in that situation many, many times. There was a time when I would say, you know what? I can combine the prayers. I'll stay and watch Kobe win this game. But what happened to me after I stayed home? Guilt-ridden, in pain. Oh my God, what? for what? Why did I do this? And when one starts to feel the, the pain and remorse for not giving God his due time instead of giving it to the Lakers, then we begin to realize there's something greater. 
right. and, and this is what we need. Right. We need to feel guilty and hurt right. by not giving right. God his grace. And that's ultimately why, maybe one of the reasons why shirk is so bad to begin with. Because God cares for his creatures that he doesn't want you to experience such pain that you rely on a type of idol. So then let's move on to see how can we dismantle and how can we move away from this? What are some things that we can do to recognize our own shirk? And what are some things that we can do to dismantle our own shirk? Ahad Saab, any advice? Yes, from our own personal perspective, what, one of the most basic things we can do is remember to thank God for every good thing that we see happening around us, perhaps something that we have participated in. When people praise us, we must say, well, I appreciate what you say, but it is, it is a blessing I have received. So at every point, our humility expressed will remind us deep inside that all grace flows from God. That would be a safeguard against any kind of shirk from us. So then what are some things that we can do, some practical things that we can do mm -hmm. to show our gratefulness to God? Very simple. Being Ahmadi Muslims is very simple for us. As I was saying, the seven levels of heaven and being denied for certain issues. At the end, our Khalifa says that follow the Sunnah. Follow the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Namaz, Salat. It's truly amazing. There are moments, and it's not all the time, but there are moments when I, I, I'm in prostration, I'm standing before Allah, and, I, and I'm in prostration, and I'm truly focused on what I'm doing, what is my purpose, and I prostrate myself before Allah. A feeling of awe uh, just comes over me, and at that moment, you know within yourself, everything's gonna be all right. Everything, Allah's grace and mercy is with me. So when we follow what we've been taught since, since kids, well, since they were kids, I was taught it in 97. But when we're, when we're taught the, the creed of Islam and Ahmadiyya, what it stands for, what is expected of us, there's nothing that can defeat us. There's nothing that can take our mind away from Allah and, and being one with God. Nothing. That's a very important point. Once we hold the fortitude of Islam, oh, yeah. then the onslaughts of any other type of temporary attacks really don't have much of a chance. But when we, when we stay home and watch the fourth quarter, instead of coming to the mosque, we're, we're, we're opening the door for the whisperer. And he whispers in our ears, say time, right. says stay home. Right. You can do namaz later. Right. Oh, it's too early in the morning to get up for Fajr. Oh, I'm so sleepy. Oh, you can do Fajr later. Right. These are the traps. Right. These are the tricks. So these are the beautiful principles that we should really follow and live by. But we need to also think of some practical examples that we can start doing right now to kind of slowly walk away from any type of shirk or any type of idol worship that we may have fallen into. What are some examples that you all think that we can do? Yeah, here in the middle. Actually, in the Holy Quran, Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 14, it says, Inna shirka la zulman azim, which basically it was saying that Hazrat Luqman was telling his son that shirk is one of the worst possible sins, so don't do it. So in the book, Conditions of Bath, it tells us that um, one story that this old man was saying that he would rely on his sons and he, would don't, he, would, he didn't need anything in his old age because his sons had money. And what we could learn from this is that you shouldn't say these type of things even though you have them and that you should rely on God mainly and be humble and um, be in humility because if you say these things, Allah could actually take them away and then what are you going to be left to? Nothing. Right. Right here in the front. I just wanted to say one quick comment before um, about what you just mentioned. Um, the, the point that Professor Patrick made, I think, was what hit the... Uh, uh, hammer on the on the nail, which basically remembering God, and if you um, focus on the good, because what happens is when you when you look at shirk and you look at the negative things, for example, the media and this that, and you do it consistently, then that becomes normalized to you. You start getting psychologically, it goes in and it penetrates your mind. But if you kind of go on the flip side and now you remember God, you pray, you 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 read your holy scriptures, you know, you you get involved with the community service. 
things that will kind of take you away from the negative things that may bring you down. I think that's one of the most practical things we can do is remembering God and, and doing good works, uh, essentially. But my, my question to the panel after this uh, is basically in terms of um, the Hindu community, for example. I mean, wh where do we draw the line? Like, for example, I have a Hindu friend who, who does worship idols, and I've had a deep conversation with him, and he said that it's not me believing that this is actually God. Um, you know, I believe in there being one God, and this is just a, a physical form in my mind that I can see, you know. I can see, I can go pray. And, and someone, a community like that, you know, that has so much positive, I mean, what are your guys' opinions and, and your take in terms of, uh, of, 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 of someone doing shirk in that level? I mean, if it's not detrimental to their livelihood or their family life or their life, is it bad? Oh, so you want to take that question on? Yes, I'll try to. Uh, Jazakumullah, that was a great question. Uh, I believe, uh, just as many of my fellow Ahmadi Muslims do, that all the Hindu idols that we see materially are simply manifestations of uh, the attributes of God. But the trouble is the Hindu worshiper, by and large, does not think of it as just a manifestation of an attribute. He or she considers it a real God. So they, uh, all Hindu worshippers, uh, are, have my respect, but I would advise people, Hindus and others, to rise above the concrete and go into the abstract realm. Just as a child can only conceive of things that he or she can see and cannot conceive of an abstract, such is the lot of many worshipers. They're stuck with the material depiction of a divine quality. But once they realize that these are just depictions, the one God is supreme and, um, and forever lasting and in a, in a sense formless, shapeless, then he or she will have a better con concept of the universal God. So as a stopgap measure, worshiping a material idol and having great thoughts about service to humanity, love for all and so on is okay. But there's a danger that we will be fixated upon that object will be stuck at that level and will never rise to a higher level. So I would recommend rising above it as fast as possible. That's a good point. We had some comments in the front. In order to answer the question how we can um, stop committing shirk, I think we need to understand the situation. And um, when you see something, it's uh, Hollywood and the media affects our culture. And in turn, our culture also affects Hollywood and the media. So. It is a mutual relationship. And when you step back and look at this in a different angle, you'll see that our behavior also affects culture. So if we change our behavior, we will change culture. And eventually, the media will pick this up and cycle it through. So if we change our behavior to, let's say, not commit shirk and not do all these things and idolize things, then eventually, the media will pick this up. And our culture will, will reinforce that behavior. In the back. Uh, I just want to add a quick comment that we need to remember that today we're here, tomorrow we'll be under the grave. Um, we need to remember what we're going with. On, who knows, but on my drive to home, um, something happens, God forbid, I pass away. What am I going with? What am I taking from this world? Am I, take, um, am I going with shirk? Or am I going um, with uh, um, praising God? We need to remember that. Right. What type of legacy are we creating for those before us? Are we creating a legacy that will die with the stones that are creative, or are we creating a legacy that will live on because of the nature of God's very existence? Right here in the middle. Yeah, another comment I wanted to make was that um, one of my friends in the Jamaat, he actually went to Africa a year back for Humanity First to build some wells in um, cities in Africa that don't have water. And one day he was working all day and he did not eat for like 24 hours and he was walking home and there were no shops open. So when he was in that situation, he prayed to Allah Ta'ala saying, Allah Ta'ala, everything is in your hands. There's nothing I can do. Everything is in your hands and you can give me food if you want. And as he was walking by home, Somebody from the Jamaat was walking by and he had a, an extra para, um, an extra portion of food left in his bag. 
So um, they started talking, and he was like, have you, have you eaten? And he, and he said no. So luckily, Allah Ta'ala actually gave him food. And so what we can take from this story is that even though there's so much shirk in this society today, if we leave everything in Allah Ta'ala's hand and remind, us, con- remind constantly to ourselves that, that we should leave everything in Allah Ta'ala's hand and that we have nothing compared to him, everything can actually turn out all right. That was very well said. We need to remember the importance of prayers. After all, when the first few words when Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih Khamis, Aida al-Abn Aziz, um, was given the privilege of being selected as the Khalifa of the time, the first things he told us was to pray. And that's something that we should remember all the time. Now, in closing, I'd like to give the panelists a one-minute final words that you would like to leave us with on this topic of idol worship. Ahad Saab? Uh, I can build upon what our brother here said. We can all in our own small way and in our own small universe start inculcating habits of humility and thankfulness to God and gradually removing all the objects that we venerate from in front of us. And if we can do this by the thousands every day, then culture, the uh, ambient culture all around us will gradually change and will become more God-fearing and less dependent upon material objects. So that is the message that I would like to share with others. Jazakallah. Many years ago, a sweet-talking man had a group of approximately five people who gave ear to his sweet talk. This man used a mind-altering drug to really cause them to really be focused on his sweet voice. This man convinced these young people that he was godlike. This man had an ultimate plan to create turmoil in the world. And this man took these five young innocent people, mind-altering drugs and all, and went and destroyed Sharon Tate and a couple other people. That's one half of the coin. The other half of the coin is the fact that we're Ahmadi Muslims. We're not Christian, we're not Shia, we're not Sunni, we're Ahmadi Muslims. We have a purpose, we have a calling. Fahad and I, uh, Amma Sayed and I, Usman, Usama, every Saturday morning, we make bag lunches, sandwiches, and chips, and water, and we take it to people who are the lowest of the low, the poorest of the poor, the weakest of the weak. And when we get there, they all run to my car. And with a smile on their face, they take this food, and they're so happy. Now let us remember that we have a purpose in life greater than shirk, greater than trickeration. Let us fulfill our our mission in life you know we 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 talk about all these different things oh let's do this let's do that but we're Ahmadi Muslim we have a purpose in life five time daily prayer carry the truth to all the people around California Mexican black white whoever let us do what we were put on this earth to do and be the light of the future thank you so in, in, in my own tradition of, of Mormonism, one of our scriptures uh, that, that I love says that when you're in the service of your fellow beings, you're only in the service of your God. And that's very much what Brother Alim has, has just said, that, that I think the best way for us to counter uh, idolatry, shirk, these kinds of things, is to get outside of ourselves. That is to, because so much of it is about focusing on our own ego focusing on, on ourselves. It's all about me, me, me. Uh, you know, we talk about iPads and iPhones. I think we're part of the I generation, right? And, and we, uh, we focus so much on ourselves. And so I think what, what God gives us through prophets and through scriptures, he gives us guidance to get outside of ourself, it, to serve other people, to serve him, to, uh, to, to look at our own weaknesses and to rely on God uh, and uh, to acknowledge that it's only through him and through his love and his grace that, that we can get better. So I think it is through those daily acts of service, daily acts of devotion, that we can reduce our reliance just on ourselves 
increase our reliance on God and foster better relationships with the people all around us. That's what he's called us to do. Thank you. That's the universal message of God that was sent to all his people all throughout the world. And today we've been looking at the words of the promised Messiah, peace be upon him, expounding on commentary that is derived from our beloved master, the prophet Muhammad of Islam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him. Looking at the concept of shirk and looking at how it's something that hurts our lives, yet something that we can fight against to become even better people. But the conversation doesn't have to end here. You can continue talking to us on Twitter by connecting to us with at MTA underscore Real Talk. You can email us, find us on YouTube. The links are on the screen. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.